to say I'm still feeling very much in the Thanksgiving spirit. Of course, the holidays are officially upon us. And thankfully, today refreshes upon us. And you know, this is our time to connect, to be inspired, to learn something, and ultimately to feel a bit better for it. I hope you're feeling better already, because this is the time we get to spend together. Back to Thanksgiving for a minute. I hope everyone had a, a good holiday. I know it can be fraught with unmet anticipated needs or visions or whatever. But I have to tell you, I wasn't in America for Thanksgiving. I think it was the first time in my whole life that I haven't. And it was so interesting because I have to say that even though I was with my son, who is my family, I realized just how much I missed the traditions of the holiday. I can, I can smell the air where I would be sitting. Um, it was like almost so much of it was just baked in my being. And thinking of a holiday where, you know, you're grateful, you profess your gratitude, you share it with many people, it's so special. And then to be in an environment where like, you know what, it was just a regular Thursday where I was up in Kiryat Motskin. But when I think about holidays, do you ever do it? Like every time it's Mother's Day, I'm thinking every day should be Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. I have a special holiday. Every day for that matter should be Father's Day. We should always take the time to appreciate. Why should we have the day? And yet we do need the day. But we should be thankful every day. And I did think about that a lot when I was away. No matter how dark or challenging a time it is, and I know people are always, we're in that swirl, there is a sliver of light, a time to be grateful. The sun is shining, I'm breathing today. Or as I can say on the golf course, I don't know why I use this metaphor, but my son and I went and played golf and he was terrible and he was just so upset. And I'm like, you know what? Here's an opportunity to hit some good shots and hit some bad. And you know what? Generally, it's more bad. But I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to hit the next one. And I have to tell you, and while we all hear it, it's worthy of um, edifying. The research on gratitude as a practice for mental health is well documented. As Dr. Mel Greenberg, she says, experiencing and expressing gratitude is an important part of any spiritual practice. It opens our hearts, it activates positive emotional centers in the brain, and a regular practice changes the way our brain neurons fire into more positive automatic um, patterns. Positive emotions can evoke and soothe distress, broaden our thinking, so we can develop a larger and more expansive view of our lives. In other words, it's mental health. We have, we have the ability to actually be our best mental health providers. All you gotta do is be grateful. So getting back to refresh, which I told you I am so grateful for. I'm grateful for the conversation we have, the fact that we're together and the opportunity to learn and especially for our guests. And today in particular is a woman who I have so long admired and whose friendship and leadership I am long grateful for, Pamela Culpepper. Pamela agreed to join us at Generation W many years ago. I can remember it distinctly. She's got this quiet power about her. She led at that point global social responsibility for PepsiCo and has been back many times and most memorably during a COVID um, for a remarkable conversation between uh, her and her beautiful son, Jordan. Again, we're, we're highlighting relationships between moms and sons. She's had an extensive career focused on people, providing them with the spaces, tools, and atmosphere they need to be their very best. So, you know, at Generation W, we're all about being our very best. So we're so happy she's here. She's about leveling the playing field, cultivating good people leaders. She's here today to feed our souls with the courageous energy we can all channel to speak up, out for ourselves and for each other. Today, she's a managing partner of Hannon Hannon. Han Han I knew I was Hannon Associates, a search firm where she leads the leadership practice. And drum roll, please. She's just been appointed a director of Prada. Yes, that Prada. And she hasn't told me about any special discounts yet, but I can say she's the first African-American woman to sit on Prada's board. She is the one. She is the only Pamela Culpepper. Pamela, I am so happy, as you know, always happy to see you. How are you? Donna, thank you so much for um first that great introduction um and then secondly just so grateful for you i um i you're so busy that sometimes this is the only way i can get to spend time <laughs> with you so if this is it i am i am so grateful to be here i'm i'm um 
happy to be here with you. Yeah, I don't know. Grateful and guilty both start with G. It's <laughs> they are like, I'm like, oh my God, there's so many times we're going to talk and we haven't, but here we are. And there's so much yes. good stuff. You have had a remarkable personal journey. journey. Yeah. And we know that we, there's so much to learn about each other's stories that we never get to really share. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the positions that you take. And you always encourage us to learn about the people around us. Yeah. Today, can we learn a little bit more about you? Sure. Um, you know, I'm not sure what what you don't already know or even um, your well, friends. Well, I would are. assume that like a lot of these people don't know very much. At yeah. All. Yeah. OK, so so let's we won't start from the very beginning, but let's let's start with um, 25 years in human resources. Um, I spent most of my formative years in PepsiCo, sort of growing up in the field, growing up in and what I love um, about human behaviors and thinking through how to make people their most successful selves in the workplace. Um, I've been in four industries, uh, spent probably 15, 16 years um, in more senior level positions. Um, and I think most of my experience during that time was um, really focused on culture, uh, M&A, um, global DE&I, and all of those things that um, sometimes become ancillary to what makes a company successful, but have proven to be the most important. Ah, and we should talk about that. There's so much literature now about, you know, human resources was over, always over here, but now human resources, the chief human resource officer now reports to the CEO. It's now seen as a pathway to the CEO um, uh, office as well. Not yeah. happened before. What happened? Why all of a sudden, I don't know. Are people so important? Well, I mean, I think I think that um, it, it, there's two things that I would point to. I would point okay. to the fact that um, the social media outlets that allow people to speak their voices and talk about their experiences um, and um, allow them to sort of build this rapport with multiple organizations is important. I think the second thing is sort of this generational influx of people who's, uh, who are demanding that their voices be heard um, and who have choices and who are probably way more confident in themselves than maybe perhaps we were coming up in, in corporate America. Um, they, uh, when, when I say they have choices, they are making informed decisions about where they work, how they live, how they share their time, how they balance, how they balance their lives. Um, and uh, I, I, I think companies are, are, are hearing that, are seeing that, and CEOs especially are becoming attuned to the fact that there has to be so much more emotional intelligence in their businesses than there are right now. Okay. So, and you help companies get emotional intelligence. What do you tell them? I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I would like to have more emotional intelligence. <laughs> well, you know, so, so. So part of it is channeling, channeling what they already have. So it's not that people aren't emotionally intelligent. They just don't necessarily um, exercise that muscle. And for a long time, it wasn't okay to exercise that muscle in the workplace. So when we talk about um, you know, bringing your whole self to work, it has to incorporate who you are, how you are, and your ability to talk about those things. So when I'm talking to executives, um, I literally am, am, am helping them think through what's going to be the best way to engage and excite and inspire your workforce. And how do you pull from places deep within that you have had dormant for a long time because it was not appropriate to bring that forward into the workplace. So when we talk about executives being vulnerable or executives being authentic, it really is about them um, bringing parts of themselves to work that they did not do so beforehand. What about what about employees? I'm, and I'm curious as to what our community here. And then let's see, Katie. I haven't heard from you. Who's out there with us in, in Facebook land? Hello, everybody. Um, we talk about executives being vulnerable, authentic, mm -hmm. but and but then employees, right? We mm -hmm. talk about their you know, employees being vulnerable and authentic. Yes. Um, yes. Is there a line? Now, I would say in the land, but is there a line to be crossed or not crossed at the end of the day when everybody does have to come together and produce a product or yes. accomplish a goal? Yes. 
Um, I, I'm sure there are lines, but let's let's talk about um, the the line that should be crossed. And the line that I think should be crossed is that people bring ideas from all over. Um, and in the past, it was hierarchically appropriate to bring forward an idea. Now it's where should we be asked, what should we be asking our employees that we have been wrestling with as, as executives for years that could possibly be um, a solution within our workforce? So how do we invite people to the table to talk about the things that they think we should and could be doing better in the organization, right? So, so, so the line to me to be crossed is one where we are welcoming more voices to the problem solving, to the thought leadership, and, and, and in ways that we can only imagine erase some of the hierarchical lines and erase some of the, the, the instances where good ideas have been muted because of your level in the organization, because of you know, where you um, sit on a leadership team, how do we invite more voices? Um, and then you know, encourage a level of confidence in our leaders that some of those voices and some of those ideas could actually work. Uh, yes, totally. I guess I, I guess I also I guess I see it from the, also the other side, which is encouraging the the all voices to feel like they have a place to say something and can be heard. Yes, um, and that it's worthy because yeah. often you know you can go and say, okay, I'm open, and if people know me, I'm very open. I'll say, what do you think? Well, why do you want to know what I think? <laughs> and I get that a lot, you know, and I'm sure people will find that well. So it's really kind of a meeting of the minds. Yes. In terms of having a an internal courage. Yes. To be able to say, yes. here's what I think. And, yes. and people also measure themselves in terms of how much experience or exposure they may have had, mm -hmm. right? There is that kind of hierarchical, you can't speak on this until you've had this. But okay, yes. you never yes. know. Out of the mouth of babes, they say, right? That's that's exactly right. And I think the generation that you and I are raising are young people who didn't sit at the kids' table, who we constantly ask them what their opinions were and what their point of view on a topic was. So you can imagine when my son got into the workforce, he wasn't waiting on anyone to tell him or ask him you know, what he thought. I mean, he's very free with, it, with, it, with his opinion and very free with his, um, with his ideas. And so, and, and, and he's not the only one, your sons aren't the only one. Kids are growing up in that, in that regard. And so we have to make room, organizations have to make room for their voices or they'll take them somewhere else. Right, right. And, 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 and it is a lot about culture. So somebody, uh, thank you, Rylander. Oh, that's from, from Sherry. What challenges have you faced and how did you handle them? Like, so what are the big, what, I'm intrigued. You've been in different places with so many different cultures and yes, they're businesses, mm -hmm. but all of us, as we travel in our daily lives, we go from culture to culture, depending mm -hmm. on where we're interacting, not even business, but you know, whether it's our family culture, mm -hmm. our friend culture, mm -hmm. our retail culture, whatever that might be. What have you, yeah. what have you learned? What's one of the biggest challenges for you? Yeah. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges is one that I still hear, and that is feeling like you're being heard or valued. Um, and I think what 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 I've learned over the years is that there was a part that I played in making sure that I was heard, whether it was honing what I said, how I said it, whether it was disarming some of the leaders that I needed to have conversation with, whether it was um, you know, making sure that my voice was authentic and true to me, um, all of those things were the part that I played in making sure that I was heard. And when I think about um, bringing forward conversations that, you know, leaders were sometimes afraid to have, creating space and grace for them to be able to have those conversations and say it like they were feeling it, um, and then um, helping them in a way that's not indicting to grow from what they're what they've experienced and what they need to do differently um, is what I use to influence behavioral change. Uh, I think the other thing that I learned is that you know credibility and championship is hard won, um, and that it takes effort um, to be seen and to be heard and to build relationships with people that are not like you. 
Um, I grew up, you know, very, you know, reserved and private. And so I didn't want to let people into who I was and how I was. And what I realized was that the, le the, the, the less people knew about who I was, the, the less likely they were going to be able to champion me um, and, and be able to talk to my character. They could talk to my competency, but they couldn't talk to my character because I didn't let them in. So, so one of the greatest lessons I learned uh, and I'm still learning um, is that relationships are everything um, and cultivating them early uh, is really important <laughs> so that I'm not trying to build one when I need it. Oh, that is so important. And you know, we have uh, Generation Wow, as you know, mm -hmm. and um, it's our teen girls. We believe in the wow of our girls. We believe in the positive and the possible. Actually, that's yes. going to be our theme for Generation W 10 years now. Yes. And I'm, I'm in I'm in Israel with my son and we're talking about relationships and the new community. And and I and you know, we have always prioritized for our young girls that connection is the most powerful superpower that you should prioritize. Yes. It's about feeling comfortable. It, it, even at ninth grade, we even have some sixth graders. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, like generationally, for them to understand that start now. Yes. People are all around you. People are willing to care about you if you engage them. Yes. And it never ends, right? Like, yes. you know, I feel that's how I feel about our relationship, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I value you. I love yes. you. Yes. I yes. love talking. And you know that, right? And so therefore, okay. no matter what will ever happen, you're a phone call away from me and I'm a phone call away from you. That's exactly right. And cultivating that, I think, with our young people is it's sometimes difficult because of social media, but I think one of the greatest lessons we can turn, we can we can share with with the teen girls, with 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 young and up and coming leaders, is that relationship is a diversity imperative as well, which is building a relationship based on your frame of reference is one thing. Building your relationships on their frames of reference, so. If it's a, if, if handwritten cards are still important, phone calls are still important. Um, you know, yes, text is important, but how do you diversify how you build relationships based on the people you are building those relationships with? I think it's still really important that we 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 lean into people from wherever they are, um, so that we can incorporate as many um, opportunities for connections as possible. That's so powerful. And, I, and I'd love to stay there, but before we do, um, Brenda asked a really good question about shaping company culture. Yes. And she also referenced the fact that HR leaders, not particularly you in this case, but <laughs> teams are not highly skilled. And I will say mm -hmm. that I have found that to be a truism in many experiences that I've had or friends have. So how do you, how do you lead cultural change? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, that question. It's a great question. Uh, you know, and I, I think because I spent time on, um, on, on multiple, in multiple areas of HR. So I spent time on the transactional and the um, traditional ways of HR. I spent a lot of time on what I would call the non-traditional, which is organ organizational effectiveness, um, uh, organizational development. And I also spent time on the DEI side. And I think all of those roles have helped me um, have a frame of reference from each of those points of view. And I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is that HR um, uh, has built its, its reputation and its abilities around helping the business to function. Right, so it there's an efficiency that comes from HR. There's there's protocol. There are traditions. There are practices, but none of those things um, really get at the heart of how you um, increase the engagement and productivity of employees. Because there's a there's a heart and a mind associated with um, what people do with their hands. Um, on the DEI side, there has been this singular track. Of, of focusing on those things, but never shall the two meet. So HR um, and DEI were always fighting for share of mind. 
Um, and so what I started to do in my practice is help DEI leaders understand what, um, what's happening from an HR frame of reference. I'm also doing the same thing with HR. So I'm bringing the two together and I'm having them think through if there is a North Star that incorporates bringing people together, bringing systems together, tackling and looking at the systems that currently exist and whether or not they are evolving with the people that we're bringing into the workforce. If they're not, how do we tackle those things together? So DEI leaders need to know more about what's happening on the HR side. HR and, and on change leadership and how to, how to really influence change, HR leaders need to do the same thing. So why don't we do that together? Why don't we develop um, protocols and practices and, and opportunities for the organization to really build its, its, its new culture, um, incorporating both of those things? A DEI leader can't make any, can't, can't make any progress without understanding the talent systems. Um, HR, who owns the talent systems, can't make enough progress unless they are incorporating the voices, the experiences, um, the diversity of thought. If they're not incorporating those things and building out those systems, then they are slow and sluggish and sometimes they fail. So my role is to, is to be the liaison between the two, to speak both languages and help them um, build new systems and new cultures um, to affect the leaders that they have coming in and the people that they have coming in today. Hey, Brenda, I hope that helps a little bit. I thought it was a great answer. And it's a really relevant question every single day. It's never irrelevant mm -hmm. to talk about culture, right? Everybody, everybody, everybody is thinking about how they're part of something that's positive. Um, and they feel valuable to, uh, towards that. Again, anybody have any questions? We're at Refresh today with the amazing Pamela Culpepper, a champion of people, diversity, inclusion, incredible thought leader for many, many years. So if you have any questions, I, I mean, I uh, sorry posted another question, but I, I have one for you. Have you seen change? Are, are we are we making a difference? I have to, you know, I have to say, um, there are days I feel, well, you know, the, the world is very different. I feel mm -hmm. that. And then there are other days as a woman in the workforce, mm -hmm. maybe not as much as I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Donna, that's, 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 that's a tough question um, because I have to add on for me, the intersection of being a black woman. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, there's lots out there that would suggest that people are exhausted Mm -hmm. um, and that it's hard for them to, um, you know, to keep up the face of moving forward when they see us take so many steps backwards. Um, and so I would say to you that um, in the sphere that I can control, um, I think I'm making a difference. Uh, it's hard for me to, to, to speak about the we. And so, so in order to keep my head, I think, above ground, I think about what I can what I can control and what what solutions I can impact. Um, I think that that there are organizations that are sincere and authentic about the work of their people. Um, I think that many companies made uh, a number of promises that their workforce is holding them accountable for. So many of them are are still, you know, checking boxes and they're they're working on on their list. But there are other organizations, I think, that are sincere in this effort. Sometimes that sincerity comes because they have a young workforce that's not going to let them let up. Sometimes that sincerity comes from them having um, young adult children in the workforce who are, who are talking about their experiences and reminding some of those leaders that, wow, um, I wonder if that's me. And I wonder if that's how I'm impacting the people on my teams or in my lines of business. Um, and some people are having life-changing experiences that says, you know what? I wanna be a part of the solution. I no longer wanna be a part of the problem. I don't wanna be ashamed of my ancestral um, shortcomings. I wanna be a part of what's going to be happening good going forward. Those are the leaders that I have the most time for and the most energy for. 
and they actually bring me energy. So when I am exhausted, um, I look to those leaders who are really trying to do the work, walking the talk, um, talking the talk and walking the walk and really making the differences in the organizations because they have that power. They're repurposing it. Um, and those are the ones that I, I, I try to spend the most time with. Yeah, right. People give you energy. There's no doubt about it, right? The right people for you at the right time. It could be different energy groups. You said something before. I, I, I Everybody knows I take notes all the time. <laughs> and I actually color code the notes even here. So this isn't red. That means it's just what well, you said, creating space and grace to say how you're feeling. And in today's world with social media, with, you know, the cancel culture, mm -hmm. it's scary. Yeah. No, it's scary. It is. On one hand, I want you to feel comfortable. I want you to have space and grace. And, mm -hmm. you know, even me, who's probably and sometimes more trusting than I should be, but I'm thinking, hey, mm -hmm. trust me, uh, all good intentions. I want to learn. Give me a space to learn. But yeah. space and grace can be canceled just like that. And so yeah. to me, there's this constant undermining, almost earthquake-like thing where the mm -hmm. floor can fall out from under you, even with your best intentions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think you're right. I think the when I feel the most successful, I've gotten an executive team to trust me. And what it means for an executive team to feel comfortable saying, saying what they need to say the way that they only know how to say it. And it may not be correct. It may not be politically right. Um, but in order for them to grow, they have to be able to talk through some of the things that are on their minds that um, you know could be fearful of ending up in the paper, could be repeated, could be so, so and, and in order for them to be able to teach um, and, and model that behavior with their workforce, they have to learn how to do it themselves. So when I talk about spending time with executive teams, it really is creating space for them to be able to develop skills, to develop language, to be able to hold important conversations. I used to say difficult conversations, but important conversations. They have to be able to practice that with someone. Right. And right. a lot of times there's not, you know, many of them have women in on their executive teams, but sometimes, you know, a lot of them don't have people of color on their executive teams. Um, and, and quite often not black women on their executive teams. So when I can get in a room with them and we can talk through some of the challenges that they're having and some of the questions that they have and some of the stereotypes that they don't understand or some of the biases that they currently hold that they, 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 they want um, guidance in terms of how to address and adjust, you know, even their own behavioral tendencies. Um, that's my role. That, that, that's what I spend quite a bit of my time doing, even as I um, lead the, the leadership development and leadership um, practice with Hanol, it, it really is helping executive teams find their voice in this space of culture, in this space of DEI, in ways that you know we often expect them to already know. Correct, and DEI, we've talked about this before. Um, I will say this out loud, but I see so much backlash or I hear it or there's the undercurrent of DEI, right? It, it's tied to being woke, which you know I live in Florida and there's a lot of like, well, what are you talking about? As opposed to the beauty of a you know, exquisitely structured quilt with so many different patterns and colors that enriches all of us by its beauty, there is this underside, right? Of because yeah. just diversity, equity, inclusion. What are board members, what are we all responsible for? And you said people are tired. And yeah. it's almost like, you know, at some point, you know, people are tired about hearing about women's equality. People were hot, tired about hearing about women in sports, although now women in sports are having their moments. So there is this kind of push and pull in the environment of communication, social culture, whatever it is. Um, what are you feeling and hearing? Yeah, I'm feeling and hearing all of that. And I think it, it um, some of the exhaustion are fueled in two ways. One, um, when you talk about really making change, there's a level of disruption that's expected to systems that already exist. 
And when you think about disrupting systems that already exist, um, people naturally go to, um, I'm going to lose, or I'm going to have less, or I'm going to experience something that is um, negative. I'm now going to get back what I probably put into the universe. And if those things are what, what comes up for people, it creates this, this, this defensive mechanism. So when I think about people wanting to ban books and I think about them, you know, taking a phrase and making it evil, um, it, 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 it resonates to me that people don't like change. It also resonates with me that people are ashamed. There's, there's a level of shame that comes with dredging up history and talking about what happened, you know, with our ancestors. There's, there's a shame that comes with that. And when people are um, allergic to change and allergic to shame, um, they do things that would say, okay, how do I squash the conversation? How do I push it down? How do I make it bad? And how do I try to shield people that, that, that I love from, from um, experiencing um, what happened in the past? You know, when I talk to sometimes um, white male leaders, you know, part of their conversation is this whole conversation makes me feel embarrassed about being a white male, or it makes yes. me feel yes. ashamed of what, what, you know, my ancestors did, or it makes me feel, um, you know, uh, less competent um, about how to lead and inspire and be authentic with my people. And, and again, when they're honest about that feeling, we can talk through them and we can talk about how it's how the past can inform what we do in the future, or it becomes what we're doing in the future. So right. I, I just, I just, you know, I, I, I think that, yes, it is tiring when you're trying to convince people that these are the right conversations to have. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, I know you see this too, but you see people who are in um, lead roles for DEI are saying, you know, gosh, I just can't do this anymore. Um, it's too hard for me to be the only one who thinks this is an important journey. And so they're, they're, they're pulling out or they're taking their, you know, their game to other organizations and hoping that they're feeling differently about these conversations. But it's a lonely journey for people. Right. And, and it's lonely on the other side. If you're the lone African-American woman, I, wanted, I do want to talk about Prada in a minute. If you're the lone woman, obviously there's a whole anti-Semitic trope that's going on yes. that really feels ugly. But Joy brought up a great question. It's one actually I thought about when we spoke earlier, which is issues about affirmative action. And does it make DEI harder? And there was a great article this morning by John McWhorter, who's a really well-known African male uh, writer who talked about affirmative action and how he should be thinking as a black person versus a white person. And it's so interesting because we're anticipating now that the Supreme Court's going to, you know, vote down affirmative action um, plans that have been in place for many, many years. And yeah. he's suggesting maybe that's not the wrong thing that should happen. Maybe it should happen for the right reasons. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think, I think there are mixed views. I think even I have mixed views on it. I think um, if I were more confident that the world could see people for what they bring um, and secondarily think about them being black or female or you know from an underrepresented group, if I thought that universities were um, uh, deliberate in all other ways of saying that all of these voices matter, I think I would feel um, aligned with the thinking that affirmative action should go away. Um, I, I wonder if we go backwards when yeah. we take some of the guardrails away, um, if the structure was intact, uh, and, I, I, and I mean, you know, a structure that says the way that we operate right now, there's no way we could exclude people or we could leave voices out. If I thought that those things were intact, I'd be more aligned. I'm not so sure. Um, I, I think that you know there are mixed views with people saying, "Gosh, I want people to stop focusing on my ethnicity Correct. or my gender, and and really you know focus on me being a thought leader, me being 
you know, me having you having experiences that you need either in your in your colleges and universities or in your workplaces. Um, I, I just don't know, you know, again, based on some of the conversations I still have, that 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 there's not this fear um, for those who are in power that in order for us to incorporate other people, we're going to lose something. Yeah, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's all there and it brings up all those feelings that you said earlier. It's always this feeling something's going to be taking away from me. Yes. I am going to lose. But let's talk about you winning. Let's talk about all of us winning with, when Pamela was um, named as a director for Prada. Now, um, Prada has been around since 1913. Yeah. Um, for those who are not familiar, it's a high fashion line. Tell us a little bit about the brand. Yeah. Yeah, so Prada is a... Um, luxury brand. It's it's part of, of a suite of companies that um, specialize in high end. Um, so and high end is relative, right? So high end could be based on quality. It could be based on price. It could be based on um, you know who the primary consumers are. Um, but they are a brand that's been around for a long time um, and currently led by. Um, Miss Prada, who we, who we affectionately and reverently call Miss Prada, um, and and her husband, they 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 um, are still the primary owners of the business. And one of the few um, luxury houses that are still owned by um, the family. And um, you know, so 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 it's shoes, it's clothing, it's uh, a set accessories, and now it's going to be fine jewelry. So you'll start to see. Um, a bit of that um, that come up. One of the things I would say about the brand that most people don't know uh, about is that um, it is very um, female and and feministically inclined. Um, that when Miss Prada talks about edges and lines and and being able to um, you know be in definition, um, she really speaks a lot about women and the role that she expects. Uh, uh, women to play in society and, and the way that they um, help define culture and they help define some of the ways in which, um, in which we operate most effectively. Um, Prada has been in the U.S. Um, since 1998, so uh, a little longer than my son has been uh, alive. And, and part of the reason for even thinking about um, building out an ESG arm, uh, of which I am the, the chairperson for, was because there needed to be, and they wanted there to be, more focus on people. I would also add that um, the person who is on the managing side of ESG is their son, Lorenzo, who is of the generation of our sons, uh, Donna. Um, and so a part of what his legacy is going to be is legacy around people. And so he is uh, on this committee with myself and another young lady who focuses on environmental, my focus is on people. And, and, and the, the difference that we wanna make in, in the world, um, you know, with leading in with their products, the difference that we wanna make in the world is that we want the people in the company to feel just as good about the product continuously as people outside of, of the of the company so internal and external stakeholders we want there to be little to no gap between how they're feeling about the brand and working for the company that's a, and so let me add, personally you get the you get the call you are you know, we'd like to invite you to be a board member you feel pressure um you feel joy, you feel challenge, all of the above? You know, it, it, it's all of those things. But let me tell you what made me say yes. And it wasn't the brand because people who know me know that I'm not a luxury brand person, that I don't start there. Um, I, I, I was drawn to the fact that um, they realized that they have some opportunities in North America to understand better how to operate, um, what what you know, what do the people need? How do they need to um, engage? How do they need to 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 
to what environment is most critical for the people in North America. And they realize even when they bring people from Italy into the North America business, they, they still don't have um, you know, a good grasp of what that looks like. So when they sought um, someone to help them on the ESG side, it, it wasn't just globally, it was also in a, in a vastly growing part of their business that they don't understand culturally, right? So when I got the call, it was, um, there were a couple of things said, that said that drew me in. One is um, we don't need, to, we don't want to quiz you about your background. We're, we're, we're looking at what you've done and, and where you've been and how you've affected some of the communities that you've been in. And we want that. Um, and so they spent more time um, in, in uh, selling me on, on why we would be a good opportunity for them, which I, I make that comment because most of the time, uh, even in, in board interviews, they are trying to um, make sure that you're the right fit for them. And so the quiz about your background is extensive. Um, I didn't feel, I, I, I felt heard and affirmed when I had the conversations with them. The second thing that drew me in was um, we need people expertise. Um, the fact that you're a woman, the fact that you're a black woman is a plus, but those, that, those aren't the things that we are drawing on immediately to bring you in. We're drawing on your background. We need your people expertise. We will hear you and I will make sure, and this is the board chair saying, I will make sure that your ideas, your thoughts, your leadership, your points of view are front and center in the work that we're doing here. That's what drew me in. Well, and that's powerful. And oh, I wish we had more time because I, I would love to be able to, you know, ex even expand that further. But you left us with um, three great ideas. Sherry, I'd like to put them up right now because um, I think they're good things um, that we should all like kind of just jump into and will leave us feeling good. Um, you know, you asked this question, Ms. Smith, Brenda, I think everyone's thinking about it. Joy, you just uh, kind of touched on it too, inspiring cultural change. Just take us quickly, if you would, Pamela, through these three thoughts. Sure. So the status quo is simply not an option, um, simply says that the way that, the, the way that we're operating now won't be effective if we're evolving. So as the world evolves, as the as the, the people that join our workforces evolve, as our families evolve, the conversations that we've been having there, status quo is not an option. We, we, we cannot evolve as communities um, without thinking through what's going to be important for us to change. The second one is find the courage to speak up and speak out for yourself and others. Um, and I think that's a hard one, even in organizations where you know, leaders are starting to find their voice you know, there's always the concern that if I'm speaking up and out of, uh, about myself and for myself, um, that I am going to disenfranchise myself or that I might, you know, come across as disingenuous. And I think one of the, uh, again, one of the things that I've learned is that when I couldn't be the friend to myself that I was to others, then I was always going to be a little bit behind. So how do I um, how do I say the things, not just to myself, but to others that I would say if I were standing up for someone else, being able to stand up for, my, stand up for myself um, created the opportunity and the voice for me to be able to do that better for others. Be curious and compassionate about the people around you. Um, this one is an important, for, important one for me because um, in my line of work, I have to be open to various points of view. And many of those points of view don't align with the way that I think and what I might be doing. So I, I, um, I, I am curious. I wanna know, uh, especially from those who don't think and operate the way that I do, uh, what fuels the way that you're thinking? What, what, what fuels what, what's happening? What fuels your beliefs? Because the more I know about that, the, the better and more expansive my thinking can be. Without a doubt. You are amazing. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank all of our guests. Before we go, let me just offer this. Generation W, this year on March 24th, please mark your calendars. Pamela, mark, mark yours too, please. March 24th, 
the positive in the possible. I can't think of a time more than now we're leaning into what's good in our lives and what we can make possible. To quote Pam, Pamela, when I asked her, in the sphere that I can control, I can make a difference. Generation W and the community that we have is the sphere we can control and can make a difference and help each other. It's time to purchase early bird tickets for yourself. Ask for it as a gift or gift it to others. I mean, what could be more impactful than giving somebody an experience that will lift their lives for a very, very long time? I want to close with some thanks. I think this will be our last show for 2023. It's show 67, believe it or not, since we started this adventure. Uh, as Marcia Zimmerman shared in kindergarten with her mom, Sherry Levin, if you switch thanks and giving around, what do you say? It's giving thanks. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to give thanks for Sherry, our producer, Katie and Rylander, who's always been with us to do this show, all of the entire Generation W team, and for our Generation W community of being the generous spirits that you are, Thank you, Pamela, for being the great person that you are. Thank it's you. so important to have friends in the world that you don't feel like you have to talk to them every day, but when the day you need to talk to them, they will always be there. For your brilliance, for your sharing, for everyone, remember to always look and find that sliver of gratitude in your life. It's actually really good for you and it's good for all of us. Happy holidays, everybody. And thank you for being with us and getting us all refreshed. <laughs>